Stockholm in the tightening grip of winter. A time when getting out of bed and heading for work requires a considerable amount of discipline. And if you're thinking of driving, then this is what the roads around Sweden can look like. You need your wits about you just to make it to work safely. Commuters the world over have the same problem, spending sometimes hours in transit. But very little of that time could be called effective working time. Most of us are lucky to get a couple of chapters of a novel read as the bus or train rattles on to its destination. With the best intentions in the world, it's very difficult to work on a train. There's virtually no elbow room, so your pen skates across the pad as you go around the corners. Try to dictate into a tape recorder and everybody thinks you've gone quite potty. So finally you just succumb, defeated, and surreptitiously read your neighbour's newspaper. But all of that's different for the people who travel on this train. If you've ever spent any time strap hanging on a crowded train, this carriage comes as something of a revelation. From the sub-zero chill of the platform, you emerge into a warm, elegant interior where you're assailed by the aroma of freshly brewed coffee. There are no rows of Spartan seats, but workstations in Scandinavian birch with telephones and computers. As we pulled out of the station into the pastel shades of dawn, the carriage was already humming with conversations, the computer screens blinking with pie charts, graphs and programming protocols. This is the world's first office on rails. The passengers are all employees of Sweden's giant nuclear, electrical and robotics concern, ASEA. No expense has been spared in providing staff with an environment in which it really is possible to work while they make their way to the company's headquarters at Vasteras, around 130 kilometres from Stockholm. As you can see, there are uh, extremely commodious facilities for 40 passengers, including 20 workstations with telephones and computers. It takes about an hour for the train to make it down to Vasteras, and of course, uh, an hour home in the evening. But the train's not just for A-type workaholics. Half of the time that they spend on the train is credited as working time. ASEA also puts up a third of the cost of the return ticket and the balance is tax deductible. So riding the office express is hardly a financial burden on the staff. But there are a lot of pluses. There's a conference room with seating for about 20 people. And the use of a telephone at that time of the morning can be a real godsend to tie up or postpone meetings as the day's affairs start taking shape. The uh, telephones on board are connected to an exchange on the train, which in turn is connected to the Nordic mobile telephone service. There are four lines in and four lines out, and it's just as easy to make a connection on the train as it would be uh, on a cellular car phone. The power is sufficiently stable on the train to maintain the computers without any memory crashes. As pine trees and lakes flash by outside, the staff give the desolate beauty of the landscape little attention. The atmosphere appears quite conducive to work. The carriage was the brainchild of a member of ASEA's corporate planning section, Anne Larson. She viewed winter driving and conventional train commuting with considerable dread. And we can see that people uh, uh, commuting between Stockholm and Vestros, we have a group that commutes between Stockholm and Vestros every day, and they were quitting the company much faster than the average. So we had a really hard time keeping people in, in the company. Not surprisingly, staff losses have stabilised. There's even talk of putting on another carriage. What we could be witnessing here is the complete revival of the train as a transport mode. Because just think, you can add uh, telefax, photocopiers, perhaps even a gymnasium. And you have a vehicle in which it's very much better to journey than it is to arrive. Now that's what I call a train of thought. It's a new joining device from Austria, and as we've seen, it's got some remarkable features. Have a look at this. If the parts are pushed together, uh -huh. they can't be pulled apart, but a slight twist in any other direction, oh, and it comes yeah. apart easily. Yeah. 
The secret is here. A material called flock is attached to the inside of one part and the outside of the other. The flock is made up of millions of synthetic fibres, and when the parts are joined, these fibres are forced in opposite directions and form a very strong anchorage. They can't move backwards, but with any sideways motion, they turn freely. The manufacturers claim that wear and tear on the fibres is minimal because an electrostatic charge is applied in the factory, ensuring that they'll always remain upright. The fibres also appear quite resilient to weather and will even function underwater without leaking under pressure. So one day they could possibly replace the bulky plastic or metal joints on such common things as the garden or vacuum cleaner hose. And because the fibres are non-toxic, perhaps they could replace the screw-on caps of food containers and even be used in children's toys. The manufacturers are now at work developing a system with metallic fibres which will conduct electricity. So changing a light bulb will just be a matter of slipping it on. What a bright idea. The strength of the flock can be varied for different purposes, simply by adjusting the space in between the two parts, from looser connections to virtually any strength. <laughs> Still to come on Beyond 2000, the mysterious case of the lost luggage is solved. But after the break, the Earth's atmosphere. How much longer can it protect us? Six hundred million million tons of gas surround our planet. Heated during the day, cooled at night. Swept up into storms, hurled around by winds, these gases, our atmosphere, seem far too massive and strong for we humans to change. But while the atmosphere might seem massive, it's in fact thin and fragile, and apparently becoming more so every day. Humans have walked this earth for close to three million years. Our industrial world has existed for a mere 200 years. So if you think about that a slightly different way and try and imagine humans being around for only 24 hours, then the industrial age would have started just five seconds ago. And we're only now realizing that in those five seconds, we've caused major changes to our planet's atmosphere and ultimately we will change its climate. Now, there's been a lot of talk in the world's media about these possible changes, but much of it, let's face it, has been full of hot air. Tonight, in this special report, Beyond 2000 finds out what evidence there really is for what scientists think could turn into the next century's climatic catastrophe. If the Earth was a marble, its atmosphere would be as thin as a layer of condensation on its surface. But thin and fragile though the atmosphere is, it's the only thing which allows life to eke out an existence on what would otherwise be an inhospitable lump of rock, planet Earth. Mars is perhaps what Earth would be like without its atmosphere. Considerably colder than your freezer, it's dry and almost certainly lifeless. While Venus, twice as hot as your oven, could be Earth with too much atmosphere a boiling soup of gases, again unable to support life as we know it. Earth, it seems, is just right. But what makes it so isn't just our distance from the sun, it's the gases inside the Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> and specifically, this gas, CO2, or carbon dioxide. All animals breathe it out, all plants breathe it in. We produce it whenever we burn anything, and we use it to make soft drinks fizzy. But what makes it important in the atmosphere is that it traps heat, just like the glass in a greenhouse. When light reaches us from the sun, a large part of it travels straight through the 50 kilometers of atmosphere. When it strikes the ground, it radiates back out as heat. But while atmospheric gases like carbon dioxide, water vapor, and methane can let through light, they can't let through heat with nowhere to go, the heat has nothing to do but warm the planet. On Earth, carbon dioxide accounts for just three one-hundredths of one percent of our atmosphere. And yet, without those tiny amounts of CO2, the temperature around here would be below freezing. Just minute traces of the gas affect the temperature of our whole planet. 
But it's more than tiny traces of the gas that we've been pumping into the atmosphere. Every kilogram of coal, gas or oil produces two kilograms of carbon dioxide. Each year, we put five billion tons of the gas into the atmosphere. But though it's the main culprit, carbon dioxide isn't the only guilty gas. Methane, produced by cows, pigs, and even termites, as well as by the natural rotting of vegetation, is also a greenhouse gas. The more people we have to feed, the more methane we're going to produce. Turning vegetarian won't help either. Nitrous oxide used heavily in fertilizers for all plant crops is also guilty. But while the atmosphere may be able to put up with these two chemicals, it may not be able to put up with the amount of carbon dioxide we're producing. The effect, scientists say, will be like enclosing the earth in a greenhouse. About uh, 30 years ago, uh, when it was first suggested that man might be changing the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, uh, serious attempts were made to monitor the concentration of carbon dioxide by setting up special observatories around the Earth. And so we now know for certain that those, uh, that particular gas has increased uh, uh, steadily in the atmosphere. Cape Grim in Tasmania is one of those observatories. Because the air there is blown over pure Antarctic oceans, the air whistling through the measuring instruments is some of the cleanest in the world. But in just 15 years, the air has changed. CO2 is on the increase. At Mauna Loa, Hawaii's highest peak, and at stations dotted around the globe, the story's the same. But what's to say that this rise in CO2 isn't perfectly natural, just one of nature's whims and nothing to do with humans? The answer could lie inside 1,000-year-old air, trapped in the Antarctic ice and buried under hundreds of meters of snow. Analysis of the air shows that CO2 levels remained constant for centuries. But in 1810, just 50 years after humans started using coal in industry, the levels started to shoot up. It's not conclusive proof that man's activities have pushed up CO2 levels, but it's pretty convincing. So carbon dioxide is on the increase. But is the temperature? Average temperatures around the world have been rising for the last century. But can scientists be sure that it's because of the greenhouse effect? Until recently, they couldn't. On October the 1st, 1987, a team of Soviet and French scientists published their findings. They had drilled more than a mile through the Antarctic ice to a depth of 2,083 meters. The 160,000-year-old air had been trapped at a time when Neanderthal man roamed the planet. The air was analyzed for carbon dioxide and deuterium, a radioactive element which could give an idea of the Earth's temperature. And the results were impressive. The Earth's temperature rose and fell in perfect tune with variations of carbon dioxide. The rate of climatic change uh, is unprecedented in human history, and uh, one would expect it to have quite serious uh, consequences. One can expect more coastal erosion, inundation of uh, coasts. This area may get drier, and of course that would have serious consequences in terms of uh, food production. Coming up next, we'll look at those consequences in a weather forecast for the 21st century. Carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas which threatens to overheat our planet, isn't just produced by humans burning coal and oil. Volcanoes above the ground and sea vents below the sea pump the gas into the atmosphere. ...which should drift across New South Wales later in the week. On the weather chart, this high over here is what is really affecting all the weather that we're Predicting the weather on a day-to-day -day basis is anything but easy. Meteorologists have to think of what the air at a height of up to 10 kilometres or 6 miles is doing at any one moment. And they have to know how that air will affect any other air. But imagine the task of an atmospheric scientist who wants to predict the weather of the 21st century. They have to work out not only what the air will be doing, but what the air itself will be like. Only a computer program several thousand lines long can handle the complex calculations of what CO2 might do to the climate. 
Different computer programs in different countries come up with different values, but they all point to a rise in temperature. Now those models broadly predict that in the next 30 to 50 years, uh, we will expect the equivalent of having carbon dioxide double and a warming of the planet on average of between about one and a half and four and a half degrees. The North Pole could be the hardest hit, warming by over four degrees, with the tropics warming by just two degrees. But the warming itself will do little damage. It's the change in rainfall which could hit us hard. Even harder to bear would be the rises in sea level. As the sea warms, it expands. And as it expands, the sea level rises. A two degree rise in the Earth's temperature could raise the sea level around the world by over a meter. Further temperature rises would eventually melt the Antarctic ice cap. Though this couldn't happen for hundreds of years, if it was to happen, it would raise the sea level by up to 20 meters or 70 feet, wiping out vast areas of the inhabited world. More realistically, scientists are working on the global effects of a rise in temperature of just two degrees. Atmospheric scientists admit that the computer models are simplistic, but they've nevertheless come up with a shot in the dark, a weather forecast for the year 2030. The United States faces severe problems. Droughts there will turn the breadbasket of America into a dust bowl, leaving Canada, with a now much warmer climate, to reap the benefits. California, meanwhile, will have the worst of both worlds, floods during the winter and droughts during the summer, forcing cities like San Francisco to ration water. Meanwhile, Florida and other parts of the Gulf of Mexico will be facing the worst floods on record. Moving across to Europe, Mediterranean countries will be facing droughts, while Northern Europe faces floods. Holland will remain protected from the rising sea behind the country's barrages, but London's Thames barrage may not be able to cope with the rising sea levels, and the city can expect severe floods. Up in the Soviet Union, the permafrost will start to melt, releasing yet more carbon dioxide and causing cities to sink into swamps. Parts of Southern Asia will suffer catastrophes, with low-lying Bangladesh having nowhere to escape to as the sea levels continue to rise. Australia faces an expensive shake-up, but should come out of it relatively well. The north and northeastern parts of Australia will get more summer rain, and so will the capital cities of Sydney, Melbourne and Hobart, all three of which are likely to face increased flooding. Adelaide will suffer water shortages, but things will be even worse for Perth and the southwest of the continent. These already dry areas could suffer such severe droughts that populations will be forced to leave the area. In terms of sea level rise, the Great Barrier Reef will flourish, but waterside properties, particularly along the Gold Coast, will face inundation from the sea, especially when the seas are whipped up by tropical cyclones. Further south, both Sydney and Melbourne will eventually have to consider building barrages across their harbours. So the overall outlook for Australia, more rainfall and agriculture in the north, but floods and droughts in the south. I think one of the big advantages for Australia is the extent of the, the country and the fact that the country already uh, expands over a wide range of climatic zones. And if we are to have a general shift in climatic uh, regions, then one can conceive over a period of time uh, a population centres actually moving. For the rest of the world, the picture is less rosy. Carbon dioxide is inevitably linked to our standard of living. The energy we consume, the food we eat, the products we make. Virtually everything we do puts CO2 into the atmosphere. Solving the problem will be anything but easy. We have 25, 30 years to clean up our act. There's no simple answer. We have to confront this on a, uh, with uh, many different approaches. Clearly, conservation of energy. If we try to use less energy per capita, uh, that would be important. Clearly, if we had less people, it would, uh, it would help. And therefore, a global attitude to uh, the restriction of, of uh, population growth would, is very important in this issue. It really is a problem of numbers. How many people there are that are burning this carbon? The system can't handle too many people doing it. Technology might one day come up with an answer. Coral reefs, for instance, mop up carbon dioxide by turning the gas into limestone. 
but we'd need artificial reefs covering whole oceans to cope with the amount of CO2 we produce. Any technology which can solve global problems without causing problems of its own won't come cheaply, and it'll be our children who'll be paying. All we can hope to do now is to try to prevent the change from worsening so severely that our whole civilization and way of life might one day be put at risk. The solutions won't come from our world leaders. They'll come from people like you and me. If we can be aware of the problem and be prepared to pay for the solutions, then we'll solve it. If we're not prepared to take that responsibility, then it'll be our children and their children who'll have to suffer. Our look at Earth's atmosphere and the damage we're doing to it continues on the next edition of Beyond 2000. But after the break, we go inside the world's most modern air terminal. We're going on a journey into the future, a place that looks nothing like anything you've ever seen before. It could be from some other dimension. In fact, it's the world's most modern airline terminal, belonging to United Airlines at the world's biggest airport in Chicago. And this is its showpiece, a real-life video clip that runs under the tarmac from one concourse to another, into a world of blazing neon and synthesized music. A close encounter of the soothing kind. The sound and light show is but a small part of the 500 million American dollars invested in the terminal. Instructions to the designers were simple. Take the headaches out of air travel both for the passengers and the airlines. That meant nightmares like lost baggage, equipment breakdowns and runway traffic jams had to be eradicated. Missing luggage was the first problem to deal with. And as seems to be the case so often, computers came to the rescue. A barcode similar to that used in department stores is placed on your luggage. So begins its journey into the twilight zone, that part of the operation you were always too afraid to ask about, the sorting system. A subterranean monster covering the size of six football fields seven miles or 11 kilometers of conveyor belts a system that can process nearly 500 bags a minute and have your bag on your flight in a maximum of six minutes 280 closed circuit cameras and several pairs of eyes are monitoring the conveyor belts for potential jams or breakdowns if it all looked a little confusing from the outside perhaps this map will help explain things a little better I checked in at counter number 2930, where my bag went down the orange belt and joined up with the main loop. It was around about here that the computer scanning system told the conveyor belt, which was the shortest route for my bag to take to its eventual destination, which was sorting station number 74 and my flight to John F. Kennedy. Everything is designed towards the ultimate aim of increased passenger safety and comfort. Let's hitch a ride with Martin Wolf, one of the terminal's principal architects. We had found in the United States, and probably in Europe as well, that, that air travel had become essentially a bummer. And there was no reason why people shouldn't enjoy air travel the way they had done, say, with uh, railroad travel at the turn of the century. It was an exciting, exhilarating experience. Why not make it that again? The huge barrel-vaulted glass ceilings utilize natural light, another energy and cost-efficient element of the design. About 40% of the glass is transparent. The rest is filtered with a process known as fritting, a pattern which is silt screened onto the glass and then fired in a furnace. The use of exposed structural steel adds a grandiose flavor to what is an amazing piece of architecture. Passengers aren't the only people to benefit from the project. Between the main terminal and concourse C, the designers built some 240 metres, or just over 800 feet of tarmac, which enables the planes to taxi freely on the dual carriageway without fear of collision or delays. United has 400 arrivals and 400 departures at O'Hare every day. 
processing up to 90,000 passengers. There are 11,300 people on staff at this facility, which takes up one third of the entire Chicago airport area. The facts and figures of this terminal are mind boggling. So is the noise and so are the operating costs. One way United chose to save money was to develop its own independent air conditioning system for its planes. This enables an aircraft to shut down while on the ground and be serviced at five to ten dollars an hour against the one hundred dollars an hour it can cost for an auxiliary unit. The air is chilled overnight in these huge alfoil like containers which are stored underground. The system can be up and running within minutes of a plane arriving at one of the 42 United gates. Maintaining such a vast fleet of aircraft is a round-the-clock operation, but it's all made so much easier with this spare parts retrieval system, a painless, computerized, supermarket style of operation that never complains about running endless errands. Shopping for groceries was never like this. A flight crew can radio ahead the part or parts that are required. There are 63,000 parts in store here. United says it has cut the delivery time from storage rack to plane from 30 minutes to 12. So that's the world's most modern airline terminal. Very impressive, but I'm sorry I've got to go now because I'm leaving on a jet plane and I don't know when I'll be back again. That's all from Beyond 2000 this week. On our next journey into the future, one of society's worst problems, plastic. It's simple, quick and cheap to produce, but it's almost impossible to dispose of. It's become one of our biggest pollution problems. But this new biodegradable plastic may be the answer. But although we have too much plastic, we don't have enough geese. Apparently our feathered friends only get really friendly once a year. But in Hungary, scientists are playing biological matchmakers to change all that. And Amanda follows the bouncing ball to Australia when she investigates a new computer system that lets music interpret movement. That new system will completely change the art of modern dance. You'll find out how on the next edition of Beyond 2000. I'll see you then. Beyond 2000 will be back with us in two weeks from tonight. Because next Tuesday evening, a very special television event begins. The premiere of possibly the greatest television miniseries yet made in this country about a true Australian. Set four nights aside for Melba, starting one week from tonight here on 7. Right now, it's time for the Dame Edna Experience. And her guests tonight include Charlton Heston, royal photographer Patrick Litchfield, and Mick Jagger's girlfriend, Jerry Hall. was brought to you by AMP, putting today in touch with tomorrow.